Coming up, Titus Welliver joins Ileana in just a minute. Welcome to Popcorn Talk, featuring movie discussion, news, and interviews. Popcorn Talk, we talk movies. And now, it's the I Blame Dennis Hopper podcast, starring Ileana Douglas. Eavesdrop with Ileana as she interviews Hollywood's most prominent players about filmmaking, acting, and what really happens on the set of your favorite flicks and TV shows. Hi, everyone. I'm Ileana Douglas. Welcome to the I Blame Dennis Hopper podcast. You know, we and my lovely co-host, Tamara Burke, always forget it. It's <laughs> me, me, me. No, no but I was going to mention very quickly, they just had a Dennis Hopper Day in Taos. Uh, nice. It was the second year I was unable to get Aww, there, but shucks. I'm going to get there. And people ask me all the time, am I still feeling the vibrations yes. from uh, Dennis Hopper? I very much believe in these kind of things. And I, uh, so uh, yes, Mr. Hopper uh, around always uh, a rebel with a cause. Uh, just so admire him and, and, and hope that my book and our podcast continues um, to honor yeah. him. Yeah. You know, because he was a great artist. And so happy, happy Dennis Hopper Day. So I was reading in Variety today. Actually, yeah. I saw an article about um, Kevin Bacon and John Lithgow uh -huh. on a show. It's, I think it's called Actors on yeah. Acting. And um, they showed just a little couple minute clip. And right. they were talking about how when they were making what Kevin Bacon calls the F movie, Right, Linda Footloose. Says Footloose. Right. Uh, that was the only time they worked together. Mm -hmm. And John Lithgow is only 12 years older than Kevin Bacon, but um, but a lot of the rest of the cast was younger than Kevin Bacon, and so there was kind of a big disparity in age between Diane Weist, John Lithgow, and then the rest of the cast. And John Lithgow was saying that during this, the the time that they were on location mm. um he and diane weist were really wild they were just like <laughs> wild while they were on location doing all sorts of crazy things when they weren't working right and one of the th they would throw crazy parties and um they were staying in a quote crappy motel and john lithgow's big perk was that he got two rooms in the crappy hotel um and anyway one night he and um diane weist went skinny dipping and that was pretty crazy because they were in Utah in you right. know, Mormon country and and it was you know it was just wild. It was the 80s, it was wild. So I was wondering <laughs> if you have any interesting stories about yeah, Eliana, where have you gone skinny dipping? Well, it's, <laughs> <laughs> it's funny that uh, of course uh, we've got Titus uh, coming up yes. because one of the craziest sets I was ever on was Rough Riders was John Millius all really? male all male cast. Is we that have, why it was the craziest? Because I it think was so. All men? And we interviewed Chris Noth and he confirmed some. I yes, mean, it was there was a heavy heavy drinking cast. We had Gary Busey in the cast. If you guys haven't seen the Chris, Chris Noth interview, you should watch it. It's very entertaining. He's very entertaining. Yeah. And Chris is a wild man in a very fun way. Yeah. But yeah, Brad Johnson was another actor completely out of his mind in a good way. <laughs> Titus, you know, yeah. and uh, oh my God, Tom Berenger, you know, they, oh they were having drinking contests and oh they had gosh. the rival guys from... Uh, the, the the Vietnam War movies that were the drill sergeants that yelled at each other, and they had competing things. Uh, one, you know, there was a John t was making people go out on shooting expeditions, and we went shooting, shooting guns. Yeah, Got a, a yeah. wild boar hunt that Aww. took place over Thanksgiving. So that was pretty crazy, you know. So I I wonder. So I you, to, would you accompany them on some No, of these? I was a girl. I would be well, like, I don't want to, you know. Well, Titus was just that, telling me a little bit about this, and I, I and he says the idea of you being the only woman on the set yeah. with all this testosterone. Oh, I said. <laughs> what was it like for you? Well, I, I the joke that I made, which got a huge laugh one day on the set, I, I said, I think I'm the only uh, woman on the set who is uh, not working at the local strip club. Because... <laughs> There was a strip club, and and at one point Gary Busey, and but this is for me like this is not a negative. This is why I got into show business, was like <laughs> Gary Busey was being visited by twin strippers, Fantastic. and they had to, and he couldn't act in the scene unless they were on the set, and he kept disappearing <laughs> to be with the twin strippers. And I, I said, am I the only woman on the set who is not uh, working at the local <laughs> strip club? Um, but, you know, things like that I think are really 
you know, really, really funny. And uh, some of the best antics, I guess, would probably be on a live when we were away and uh, Frank Marshall and Kathleen Kennedy were just so amazing with us. Uh, we, the closest town was, you know, two hours away and they would- By helicopter. Well, <laughs> no, it was, it was even scarier. You'd have to drive, it was like this road down the mountain oh, and, good gracious. and they rented, they basically rented out the movie theater for us so that we could watch movies. We were always, you know, snowed in. So they organized little talent shows for us. Right. It sounds like you were kind of at camp. When you it tell it was. We were that. like yeah. all, we were all I mean, sort of. Because you actually literally, literally yeah, were camping, we were like but... bad kids. Um, <laughs> we had one long weekend and I went away with uh, Ethan Hawke, uh, Josh Hamilton. And this is when I was with Marty too and there were no cell phones. No. But I went away on a trip. Uh, we had a long weekend and I, and I think it was Easter weekend. And it was Ethan Hawke, uh, myself, Josh Hamilton, uh, Kevin Brezhnehan and Christian Mioli, these four actors. And we went and we all stayed in the same room, you know, spent the night, some horrible motel room. You know, we were all there. We were just like kids hanging out, having fun. And in the morning, I was the last one to get up and the last one to go into the uh, shower, the bathroom. Well, after three men had already oh. showered, mm. the water on the floor but what it was really high and I didn't know that and it, you know at some point Ethan was like you know get up you gotta get up you know so I jumped up ran in the room of course didn't know about the water flipped on oh, my no. back and I almost hit my head on the toilet bowl I missed it by an inch I was you, you had that happen I have a question yeah were you naked when this was happening uh I think no I think okay. I, I think I kind of had some clothes. We probably were slept in our clothes because we were, you know. Well, I just didn't know if you were like literally going into the shower because that adds another layer to the I story. I don't remember. I think the day before we'd done magic mushrooms. It was like pretty <laughs> crazy. <laughs> You know, it was a three-day weekend. That's all I, I was yeah, like, yeah, our yeah. only three, and, yeah. and no Just, cell phone. It's probably only a, a one day off. It and seemed like a three-day three day weekend. weekend. But right. I remember lying on the ground, and these were like my buddies. Yeah. You know, we were like, we were friends. We were all yeah. like buddies. I was like one of the guys, you know, we were all real good friends. But I am lying on my back in the thing, and I got the wind knocked out of me. Oh, which is and, terrifying. Oh, my God. I remember Ethan, like, standing in the doorway, like, are you okay? And his only thought was, he goes, can you imagine we would have to explain to Martin Scorsese? <laughs> yeah, she, uh, we weren't doing anything, Marty. It's like three guys in a cheap motel, you know, in, near Calgary. We weren't doing anything, no. Marty. We killed, you know, so. she's dead. So it, it wasn't really my safety. It was more the safety of their careers that they would be able <laughs> to, to work again. Um but we did some pretty crazy things, and we played practical jokes, and it was a it was a, a you know a dream. And if anything, it's such a drag that you have to shoot movies in you know eighteen days because yeah. it's you, you don't get to have that fun and that bonding and that rehearsal yeah. and and uh, you know hope, hopefully I I think about when I'm going to be doing my movie. I'm like I hope we can have some fun and some yeah. hijinks Schedule and have an ice cream and, truck yeah. and. And because some of the fun has gone out of the movie making process, it's sure. so much about you know um, making your time. Yeah, and but the first movie budget. I was ever on, which was New York Stories, and I told this story before. You know, Nick Nolte was being wheeled around on a hospital gurney, and I was like, "Oh my god, this is everything I hoped it would be." It's like making movies is the greatest, you know. So uh, I love, you know, any kind of fun hijinks, uh, yeah. character stuff, playing jokes. You got to be very careful. Like with, you know, Frank Marshall would play jokes on us all the time. And one time we played a joke on him. We stole a Joe Pesci cardboard. He was doing this movie, uh, The Landlord or some, something like that. He was, right. a, he was a landlord. Anyway, we stole from the movie theater where we would go see the thing they were throwing out this gigantic joe pesci cardboard cutout right and it was so difficult to do a shot in the plane we were we were in this fuselage of the plane and the camera was on um you know like a, a, a like a bungee cord and it would oh, wow. go 
and they would have to they'd have to put the camera down and then he we would just hear him the top of the plane would go on and the the you know the camera by remote control would oh, wow. would be going around us around us you know and we were doing the lord's prayer in this shot and so we had the gigantic cardboard of of joe pesci and we put a parka on him and we had it all planned you know because we, we were like all right I'm just gonna put it there. You know, and we had it in front, you know, and so when the camera was like, you know, and it, you know, it got to me and it was in front of me and we did Joe Pesci. Who the fuck book me on this flight? <laughs> Get me off this fucking plane. You're a fucking, like, you're a fucking cannibal. Blah, 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 blah. And Frank Marshall did not laugh. Oh. He was really, God damn it, you guys work over, you know, and he played jokes on us all the time time we we stopped shooting we had a gag reel we had a gag reel that we spent more time on than well, the that's movie you were cannibals <laughs> we did it he we shot an entire scene about now that you're rescued what are you gonna do we're going to disneyland because we were a disney movie and, but we played that one joke on him and it did make it into the gag reel but he was really pissed he laughed about it he later on he said it was funny but at the time well, under under pressure though but and, you got to be careful i yeah. used to do jokes Oh my God, all the time. And Nick Nolte in Cape Fear, you know, uh, I would ask Marty, can we do a, you know, yeah. we did a scene in Cape Fear where he came in and, you know, he has to come in. I've been all beaten up and we did a, a thing and he, he came in and he sat down and I said, I have something to tell you. I'm pregnant, you know, <laughs> and like, and, but Marty knew about it. It was very funny, but you know, cause I'm a clown, but, uh, I can't imagine doing that now. No way. Everyone mm -hmm. looks like they're humorless and looking at their watch so of course oh well i'm we'll, we'll see anyway we've yeah. gone way over a hijinks but <laughs> let's fun bring to in talk titus. about <laughs> i'm so excited to talk to titus he is he's working constantly he's in everything my god but i've uh, he's been on nypd blue of course brooklyn south deadwood very famous for being in law sons of anarchy Every Ben Affleck movie ever made, including Argo, uh, Live by Night, The Town, Gone Baby Gone, and of course, currently on uh, Bosch. Please welcome. I haven't seen you in so long, but it's so nice to see you. Titus Welliver, hello. Hello. And welcome. How Thank are you enjoying you. doing your series? Have you ended? Tonight's the finale. Or... No, no, no. Okay, coming we... up? We uh, we do ten episodes a season, and then they drop them all at once. So they all dropped in April, and so yeah. we you know people are still watching. They'll probably watch them until we finish four, which we'll start shooting first week of August. Do you know who's obsessed with you? And I don't know if you've ever met him. Do you know Josh Mankiewicz? Yeah, I know he, Mank. Oh my God, he lo I I know Ben Mankiewicz because we worked together on TCM, and then I through Ben, of course, I got to know Josh. And all he would ever talk about was whatever show you're in, he is obsessed with. He's That's, a sweet guy. He's he, actually he been to the wonderful. set and visited a few times. Yeah, he is. I, I can tell. He's got a, I think he's got a man crush on you. <laughs> I'll take it. <laughs> uh, anyway, thanks so much for, for uh, being here. This is really going to be fun. So let's, uh, let's get into my first question. Okay. What's, what's the first movie you saw and who took you to see it, if you can remember? It was, I'm pretty sure it was Mary Poppins, and my mother took me to see it. I have, uh, that, that seems to kind of time out right mm -hmm. for me, and I remember, I remember the experience pretty vividly. Um, was this in Connecticut? Yeah, in mm -hmm. New Haven. Mm -hmm. And then followed maybe less than a year by Help. So those were sort Ooh. of the first. That's oh, wow. a good one. Not nice. bad, bad flicks for your first films. And did it, did it scare you at all to see the movie? No, I remember just wanting to be able to have that ability to jump into the sidewalk in those chalk drawings like yeah. Dick Van Dyke and Julie Andrews did. Yeah. Um, and I was a little guy, but I, I definitely grasped what was before me. And, and I think it sort of, uh, you know, it was the bug that sort of caught me. And both of my parents um, were loved film. So that mm -hmm. was just a consistent thing every week. And obviously this is way before... VCRs and, right. and DVDs and things like that. But I think every weekend, if it wasn't something that w had just come out in the theater that mm -hmm. was sort of age appropriate, and a lot of times not necessarily age appropriate, yeah, um, there were uh, both at Yale and then later at University of Pennsylvania, there were always 
you know these these film festivals and or screenings of, mm -hmm. of classic films. Did know. they take you to? Because I know if you mentioned Yale and you were in New Haven, did you see any of the theater productions or? No, because I I, I was definitely too young to mm -hmm. to sit through that. I just didn't have the attention span. I mean, years later, obviously, I went back and right. um, my my sort of um, quasi aunt, um, her brother was the. Um, designer Bill Rittman who did the Albee plays and mm -hmm. so she was kind of a catalyst in sort of moving me and introducing me to the theater which sort of happened years right. after that and then of course going to see stuff at the Yale Rep and the Long Wharf yeah some of the I know it's funny I don't think people normally think of Connecticut as being an artsy state but I it really is I mean it's got its blue collar that's what's to me it's the dichotomy of Connecticut yeah it's very blue collar on the one hand, and you've got Groton Submarine, and that, but then you have a real artsy uh, history with shows that open there, and yeah. you think of the fifties. Well, a lot of a lot of uh, you know, Yale has their 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 summer um, mm -hmm. fine arts painting program in the yeah. boonies, and where I am, I have a place in the northwest corner of Connecticut, and that is, I see more actors there. <laughs> <laughs> at the supermarket than I do walking around. Uh, I mean, Michael J. Fox and, and his wife were there, and mm -hmm. Campbell Scott and Meryl Streep, and I used to run into Jill Clayburgh all the time at the, at the supermarket, wow. God rest her beautiful soul. But uh, there are a lot of uh, cinema gypsies that live up there. Yeah. It's sort of a great balance, right? Because, uh, you know, my neighbors are actors and writers and producers and directors, and. Mm -hmm carpenters and farmers and so it's uh, yeah it's but there's an appreciation of of, of artists uh, i found in connecticut absolutely very there's a there's and there's a lot of colleges and so yeah. i think there's a lot there's a big sort of literary artsy tradition at least there was when yeah. when i was you know when i was growing up and your dad was a painter yeah and so did that influence you at all to ever want it to be become a painter yeah i studied i started sort of formal training with him at about 12 or 13 years old because I thought that's really what I wanted to do. I didn't mm -hmm. dare tell him what I really wanted to be was a comic book artist because <laughs> he would have just flipped out. But um, And I pursued that and I did a year of art school mm -hmm. at Bennington and it, it just was not, it was one of those things, the constant comparing and contrasting. My father had been my teacher so of course yeah. I learned how to how to paint from him. So mm -hmm. there, were, there was going to be that but I just uh, I felt like I'm never going to step out of that shadow and so mm -hmm. I, I kind of abandoned it after a year of art school and I had always uh, been interested in acting it was something that I'd done in high school and some workshops and I just uh, said to my father that's what I'm gonna do and he mm -hmm. said okay go ahead go go do it so I, I, I kind of went back to New York and started at the HB studios because it was really the only place that I could afford but they were mm -hmm. great teachers I mean you know uh, who were some of the Buda teachers? Hagen and oh, Walt Whitcover and yeah. Bill Hickey. <laughs> everybody, who's, everybody has great <laughs> Bill Hickey stories. He was yep. a wonderful teacher. He was a wonderful teacher. I mean, he would be absolutely bombed out of his mind in class. And I used to, uh, the first class I ever took with him, I thought, Jesus, this is just going to be a colossal waste of time. But <laughs> he was one of the. He was a functioning drunk and he yeah. and and I think it kind of uh, he was so loose that he could look yeah. into your soul and kind of straighten you out well in those days I went to school I moved to New York I was in, uh, in one acting school is like 83 to 84 and then I was at the play neighborhood playhouse mm -hmm. 85 to 86 but I always thought it was funny in those days you know people yeah drank and they you all your teachers yeah. smoked like chimneys in the classroom yeah too. They all smoked, and and when then we all wanted to smoke because yeah. they smoked, and you know, it's the you go over the door and it'd be like, Sanford Meisner sm smoked, oh. and, and he, he had, had the trach tube. He had the trach. I know. Yeah. Yeah, he was he was one of a kind. What are you doing? Yeah. Talk about funny voices. What a load of shit that was. Yeah. <laughs> I used to like to go and sit in on his class. Oh, you did? You, to... Oh my God! Wait, was this the night? class that yeah he had? yeah yeah and this was around the same time yeah this was in the in the early 80s yeah i considered going there and then i uh i had friends that were at nyu and they mm -hmm. and i went and checked that out and thought that would be a good fit which it kind of you know because i bounced around i you know i went yeah. to adler a little bit mm -hmm. in strasburg and with david mamet and circle in the square yeah. and and 
Well, you. now David Mamet came, and you studied with David Mamet mm-hmm. a little bit, and he came out of the neighborhood playhouse. Yeah, exactly. So did you do the what they call the repetition? Yeah, but it's it's sort of David's version. It's a <laughs> bad, I mean, by his own admission, it's a sort of a slightly bastardized version of of Meisner. But we did a lot of the repetition game. Yeah. Which was interesting because, you know, I mean, ultimately it is what it is, which is to take the attention off yourself and put it on the other oh, person. And I loved I, it. The first few times I did it, I went, this is insane. This is insane. I don't. Uh, yeah. Because you would fall into the thing, particularly if there was a pretty girl, it always would sort of, you know, yes. fall into a decline of kind of odd <laughs> flirtation, you know. So what is the repetition game? Can you give us a little... Well, it's you're supposed to. Uh, it's it. It has to do with like living. You're living truthfully in the given circumstances, mm-hmm. moment to moment. And so his idea. So it, it, the most basic understanding is to not putting any meaning right. on anything until uh, something actually occurs. Right. So if you say you took a sip, you're taking a sip of coffee. I'm taking a sip of my coffee. Yeah, you're taking a sip of your coffee. I'm taking a sip of my coffee. Yes, Titus. I can see that you're enjoying your coffee. You're irritated by my coffee sipping. I am a little irritated by your coffee. Oh, that's great. See, so that would be, and you don't, and what's, what's crazy about it is that your level, it sounds nutty, but your level of concentration is so intense that it really, you forget the outside world. And I think that, I mean, I learned a lot. Yeah. from from doing it and it's and and my tendency was always to goose something that was always like yeah. stop right you're putting like a you put little hook you know you're putting a little opinion on it yeah. or what are you my psychiatrist yeah, or yeah. you know well, it would, it, sometimes it would go it, it would get everything really ended personal <laughs> so yeah. really personal yeah nice blouse and you know yeah. Anyway, an excuse to. We I saw many fist fights in class. Oh yeah. People just yeah. It would ultimately end with the with the fuck you, fuck you, fuck me, fuck you, fuck me, yeah. I, I, I just kind of go. What was funny was the teacher could decipher a good fuck you from yeah. like all right guys. Yeah. Let's, uh, let's yeah. Say. Yeah. You're worn out. Sit down. Yeah. Out. Yeah. Like that was good or no good. And did you do? Um, oh my god, my nemesis was called uh, preparation. I hated preparation. Yeah. That was where you have to go outside and basically you know uh, come up with uh i don't know you know some i just want a million dollars right you walk in your room your roommate of course is crying because you know they just got fired right so and then you meet up and you still do the repetition we did the repetition for a year well no i mean i I think that was something my recollection is that that we did it for years and years it was always kind of a thing to kind of warm up yeah exactly um, to get your get your brain moving a bit and it yeah. was kind of great that way and you know David kind of took that and then did his own thing with it and sort of similar in that way he would put you in those imaginary circumstances sort of improvisational but would always say you know try to stick to the intention of what you're trying to do rather than you know editorializing and uh, which, right. is, which is tricky it's hard because you there is that. There's always that secret playwright that exists inside. That yeah. And you want to you want to do well, and you want to be kind of snazzy and cool, and yeah. win the day with the teacher. And, and Mamet just did. He just did not want you to do that. Did you ever have anything? Uh, the most critical thing that helped me a lot was that my teacher Richard Pinter. Um, he I remember he said something very interesting to me that because I w- had this tendency, of course, to to make jokes or do something funny and he said uh, he called me a pervert one day he said you're a true pervert because you, you pervert your feelings and of course I was like in a pub I just started you know I was like the ground <laughs> I'm a pervert you know it's like you're so vulnerable yeah that like you I mean there were weekends I went home and I seriously like I would think about suicide because I was not a yeah. good because I was not a good actor like that's how but did you have anyone say anything that got to you or oh was, yeah and, and I it's funny because I, you know, I'd done a year of art school and then I sort of futzed around and, and went to HB Studios and then mm-hmm. ultimately went back to school and went to, to um, NYU. And so I was a little bit older than some of the guys and in, mm-hmm. in the transfer students. And so I would see some of these acting gurus and the way that the kids would just completely 
you know, hang on their every word. And, right. and I had a little bit of ex more experience and a little mm -hmm. more emotional maturity. And uh, I would, I mean, I was a circle in the square and I remember doing a scene one time, it was from Fool for Love, with this girl who wasn't, who, who was kind of a great beauty, but was had a slight talent allergy, mm -hmm. but, um, <laughs> but was doing her best. And so yeah. I, I appreciated that. And in the middle of the scene, he, he stepped in and, and grabbed her and started to shake her. And it completely it was jarring. And, and so she started to cry and he went, now do the scene. And I got furious. Right. And sort of said, what are you doing? Yeah. And a lot of those kind of um, sort of quasi methody things mm -hmm. where I would see these kids from Iowa, you know, who mm -hmm. had done the music man and suddenly they're, you know, they were the big fish in the small pond at their high school. Right. And so incredibly vulnerable mm -hmm. and impressionable and just getting sort of shredded and not being equipped to deal with stuff mm -hmm. that was coming up. And uh, I would, I, I flipped out and I just said, you know, you're, you're, you're not trained or equipped to, what are you gonna do when this kid goes back to their dorm room? Right. Where are you gonna be when they don't know what to do with themselves and they, and they feel this big and mm -hmm. that they have no business? Because there was always that thing, you have no business being on, on the stage, sit down. Right. Well, really? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, Great. I I saw it. I a lot of it, a lot of it, and it, that, that never that never made sense to me. I, I yeah. thought it was sort of like this isn't the Marine Corps. It's not <laughs> the idea that you're going Gee. to break somebody down to their to their essence to then build them back into this sort of fantastic actor. And you know, for all the great people that I had studied with, I then spent ten years trying to kind of unlearn everything that I had learned because mm -hmm. I realized I'd lost that that ability to just sort of be present. Mm -hmm. In a, in a scene and listening, which all goes back to what Sandy right. and, and, and David, they, they were all trying to sort of teach you that. And it was sort of, you know, I call it the art of fighting without fighting. Right. And suddenly you're this extremely well-trained, you know, well-tuned machine, but mm -hmm. that native instinct is sort of dissipated because mm -hmm. it's been sort of beaten out of you did you have a sense though you know for instance when the teacher said that and i was young i didn't really know my only identity was to be funny that was mm -hmm. my identity so i didn't really know any other identity i it took me years i to be an actor and kind of go okay yeah. now i actually understand right. who i am and what my strengths are so things would come out of me like lightning and mm -hmm. so it frustrated the teacher why are you so good in the one hand and so bad in the other did you find that you were consistent with your acting growth or yeah i and i think i always try to sort of put myself out there and and not stay in the safety of my wheelhouse i would try to approach things that I felt mm -hmm. would make me really, really uncomfortable. Right. But I also, one of the things, and whenever I've gone to I periodically go and speak to the students at the Atlantic Theater Company, mm -hmm. one, of the, one of the things I always say to them is, you know, in, in tandem with your training, try to connect with a good talking doctor because <laughs> a lot of stuff is going to come up that, that, and you need, you need someone to be able to, to help you process that because we, right. we, don't, we don't it doesn't come with instructions that emotional life that suddenly gets uncovered when you're you know you're bare ass naked emotionally in front of a group of people and you're trying to be public and private you know, right and, and and all that sort of hogwash I feel like again I had a it's speaking of talking doctors I had all sorts of I was always the wildly um some people loved me and some people hated me. Like I had some teachers that just like, so there was always, uh, I was the crowd pleaser in class. Yeah. Like Ileana's gonna get up and it's like, it's gonna be good. It's cause they're gonna either hate her and say something terrible or there was no, but some people, and as you were talking, I said, I, I was thinking, I bet every time Titus got up that people were like, this is gonna be good. Cause you carry an intensity. Did you all, were you aware of that intensity? Yeah, my dad used to say I was the only bull he knew that carried around his own china shop. And I was sort of, it wasn't that I sort of actively wanted to come in and make yeah. a lot of noise and, and um, but you I- You have a presence. Though. I had an idea about yeah. things and, and I was open to things, but I just didn't, 
I think part of it was because I had a very intense domineering father. Mm -hmm. And so my relationship to adults and certainly teachers was, I'm going to listen to you, Mm -hmm. but you need to treat me with respect. Mm -hmm. You're you're not going to bully me or manipulate me into doing something um, that's not good for me, Mm -hmm. ultimately. But I sort of, yeah, I, I, I... Jumped in with with both feet, and and I, I and I didn't mind failure. I always I wanted to I wanted to do well, but I also was not afraid to completely mm-hmm. and utterly fail. Right. Because I felt that I would come away from that, and then be even more analytical, and, mm. and if anything, maybe learn, and then kind of move to it to the next yeah. step. I agree with that. I and my teacher said that too. He was always like, "Do you got to fail here cuz once you get outside." Yeah, it's no fun. It's you, ugly. It's you ugly. You're not going to have that ability to No, and you can know this business again? this business brutalizes. <laughs> yeah. You know, you have to have not just to hide um, to kind of be able to deflect that, but you've got to have enough self-confidence and and self-awareness mm-hmm. to be able to really deflect that and kind of go okay yeah i know they're gonna hire the blonde blue-eyed guy to play captain america but mm-hmm. i'm gonna come in and try to be the best captain america that i can i don't, right. I don't know where that analogy came from i don't yeah I'm when comic books too when you were in new york it must have been like me but had the i mean we we saw every play i yeah. mean it's so funny how we had no money to eat, but somehow you'd find a way. Well, somebody knew somebody, or they had the twofers, or you, yeah, you'd we'd had second act a lot, a lot, a lot, we did that which a was lot. great. And you know, there were always you had some friend who was you know working as Usher, a usher, and yes, and they'd slip you in the back, <laughs> and, and that was exciting. Do you remember any great shows that you saw? Yeah, um, in the '80s in particular, it was there. There are two that kind of stand out, and one was when Pacino did American Buffalo. Oh yeah, with James I, Hayden, that one with Jimmy Hayden yeah. and also Thomas T. Waits. And, yeah, um, that was uh, big. Bob Prosky, but that was the first play. My parents took me to see the the production that Ulu Grossbart directed. That was with Bob Duvall, John Savage, and Ken McMillan. Wow, and I was young. Mm-hmm. And I had never seen a play that had profanity in it before, mm-hmm. and it blew me away. And I think I, I still to this day maintain that that was when things kind of clicked. That I thought I wanted to do that because I remember the play finished, and my father turned to me and he said, "What did you think about that?" And I said, "I felt like I was in the room with those guys, and they didn't know that I was there wow. because that was the experience." Mm-hmm. Of, and um, you know, of course, three incredible actors um but uh yeah that so buffalo and then um ralph macchio burt young and de niro did cuba and his teddy bear at the mm-hmm. public i mean i saw all, all that great theater right. at the public is because it was a little bit more accessible you could mm-hmm. you could find a way to sneak in there because there were enough holes in the walls to get in mm-hmm. but those were particularly because those were actors that i you know, they're kind of the go-to when you're a young mm-hmm. male actor. You're kind of you're looking at Pacino and Brando and De Niro right. and Duvall and and those guys. And to, so to actually see them on stage, yeah, was a mind blower because mm-hmm. you you know you were within proximity. It wasn't yeah. that sort of detached experience of sitting in a movie theater. You were like, I got spit on by Al Pacino. It was really. <laughs> close to the front of the stage and he spit on me when he came out and did the fucking Ruthie speech in Buffalo and I remember thinking I'll never wash myself again that's so funny I've, I've heard, and so it's true it, so he's yeah he's a spitter everybody talks about seeing Al Pacino and then the secondary thing is like he's a gigantic spitter <laughs> he's a gigantic my favorite theatrical moment was uh, I was in uh, M Butterfly mm. with John Lithgow, and I got tickets from school, and I was sitting in the front row, and he did something very entertaining, and I laughed really loud, and no one laughed, and he looked at me right down, and he went, like he nodded at me, <laughs> I couldn't believe, I was like, did that what? And I mean, but things like that. I mean, I lived for two weeks on that. Like yeah. I don't. I wonder if people have that same kind of excitement. 
that we well, did of like someday that'll be me and I'll look down at some I point. saw that production too and it was a blow away Lithgow you know he's a national treasure I saw him at the Long Wharf speaking of yeah. the Long Wharf in uh, Requiem for a Heavyweight wow and he played the he played the mountain character mm-hmm. he was the boxer and it was with David Proval and Richard Dreyfus and Maria Tucci I think mm-hmm Un- Arvin Brown directed it. Another one of these things where, uh, he, he, you know, Lithgow it was just from the other work that I had seen him do yeah. on the screen, and then suddenly he's playing this hillbilly boxer, and it was, you know, just inspiring. Yeah. He didn't wink at me, though. <laughs> but but I didn't laugh. I was There's... too busy crying the whole time. It oh, was just, yeah. I mean, you know, it was heartbreak on parade, and he uh, was stunning. Yeah, those were great times. Um, so now, what is there? Is there a, a like a break for you in terms of like what's your first? You're auditioning obviously for shows, Broadway shows, Biloxi Blues. No, well at that point, yeah, I didn't. You know, I was in school and I was sort of. I had a lot of friends because in my class there was um, DB Sweeney and. Gina Gershon and Felicity Huffman and Clark Gregg and um, Jessica Hecht, all these mm-hmm. really great actors. And um, a bunch of them had headshots and were trying to get out there. But mm-hmm. I was sort of, I'm in school. Right. And this is my time to sort of figure it out. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I didn't, honestly, I didn't feel, I didn't feel ready mm-hmm. at that point. And so I didn't have headshots. Yeah, but the level of um, of productions that were being done at NYU at that time were they were of, of a professional quality. I mean, mm-hmm. we had I remember we did a tribute to the group theater, and we had all these um, people coming in uh, who were you know really well established directors mm-hmm. that were coming in to direct these main stage productions, and then the student productions sometimes were. As good as anything I was seeing, you know, on Broadway, certainly off Broadway. Yeah. And that was that time where you, and we had guys like Richard Foreman would come in to direct and Ann Bogart. And so mm-hmm. you had access to these people. Um, so I just sort of felt like I, you know, I didn't have that commercial headshot with mm-hmm. glasses and laughing <laughs> and a bow tie. And, yeah, and a bow tie and the hot dog vendor hat. And, you know, I was. Um, <laughs> I uh, I didn't really I didn't venture out and then um, Frank Pliese directed a production of American Buffalo mm-hmm. that that I did and um, it was a, it was a great success and at that point then I was coming out of school and ready to sort of dive in and of course couldn't get an agent I mean it mm-hmm. was just virtually impossible and I was shooting pool in a saloon that I used to work at on the Lower East Side. This guy came in and started talking to me. He said, I saw you in American Buffalo. I'm an agent. And I thought, oh, man, this is the biggest come on. This guy's a, this is a fraud. And he gave me his card. And, and I pitched it because I thought he was just full of it. And he came back about a week later and found me and said, I haven't heard from you. What's going on? So I went, eh, OK. And I went and met with him. And he became my first agent. And what was the agency? De Point Casey Artists, they were called. It was a it was a talent agency and also represented models, mm-hmm. some 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 big models, and and then he started getting me out, and it was that you know the next step of heartbreak, yeah. the sea of <laughs> the sea of heartbreak, uh. the, the canoe filled with holes. <laughs> I never had an agent. Lorraine Bracco got me. And I always tell this story. Lorraine Bracco. I was I was in a movie that everybody wanted to be in yeah. called Goodfellas. Yeah. I was in it. Oh, I saw that a couple times. And uh, she, I was making her laugh. She's like, who's your agent? And I'm like, I don't have an agent. You, you know, and then and that's always been mine. I'm a suck up. That, that's my. <laughs> I'm a suck up. I'm a suck up. I don't have an agent, Lorraine. Can I go with you? So, um, but anyway, so there, so you're in New York and, uh, what you get is somehow you, you moved to LA or did you get a, a break that? Yeah. Once again, I, you know, I had a lot of friends that were saying, you know, that were doing the go West. I always heard thing. your name and I just it's a didn't good thing though. I went, nah, I'm not, I, I wouldn't go out on spec and yeah. And then I, you know, after I had a few jobs under my belt and then did a film, which I had a kind of sizable role in, mm-hmm. 
my then agent said, okay, this year we're going to, and it was like maybe a year and a half, do pilot season. And so I did my first pop. But I, it, it's not that I was a chicken. I just, I saw so many people kind of jump the gun and then they would go out to L.A. and they right. would sleep on people's couches for a month and a half and then yeah. come back broke, beaten to their, you know, to waiting tables. And I just thought, I don't, I, you know, I'm, I don't, I don't want to do that. And again, it was sort of the thing of feeling not ready because I had mm -hmm. this sort of vast resume as an actor in the New York theater, but I had only done a few um, small roles in films and I was still learning how to act in front of a camera. I mm -hmm. didn't, I didn't feel seasoned and I thought I'm not doing that until I feel that I can actually do it right and not have people micromanaging me I just always thought that would be the ultimate humiliation would be to kind of get out there and then have the people look at you and go Jesus what a mis I made this mistake <laughs> in my first gig it was it, you know not a great film this film called Navy Seals but it mm -hmm. had but Bill Paxton was in it and mm -hmm. Charlie Sheen and I came in and had never acted in front of a, a camera before except for you know some sort of arty arty kind of flicks mm -hmm. and here it was this massive you know studio production and I was terrified and Paxson kind of came over to me and said uh, you okay and I went I'm, I'm, I'm nervous I don't know what I'm what I'm doing mm -hmm. and he said but you know you're a, you're a New York theater guy I've seen you in in plays and I said yeah but I don't know what I'm doing he said that what you do on the stage only it's this big. Right. And then he kind of walked me through it. And after each take, I would look over and he would go. And I, uh, you know, um, we, we remained friends over the years. But mm -hmm. I, 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 I always thought, what an absolute act of grace. And yeah. what a beautiful man, obviously. It's, his his uh, death is, was, was devastating to, to not only to the people that knew him and loved him, but also yeah. to the people who just loved his work and he was that guy I mean that's yeah. the thing about Paxton he was a genuinely beautiful guy but even after that I still yeah was was a bit uh trepidatious I just thought that you know to do that it wouldn't be necessarily a failure but the idea that I wouldn't wouldn't have the technical tools to know what I was doing I just right. thought I don't want to do that I I want to I want to do it and I want to learn mm -hmm. but I don't want to come in and have someone going just stand there say the thing which i've seen before where yeah you, where you get someone who either doesn't possess the ability to do it right or just really genuinely doesn't know what they're doing and so you have to kind of walk them through it and i just thought nah, i don't want to do that well there's a you know people don't realize that when you're starting out and you only you only have a line or two you're yeah. in a you're in the scene, yeah. but you don't talk for pages and pages, and then eventually, yes, sir, right yeah. away, sir. That, that's almost harder to do. Yeah, it is harder to do. Because the camera's going to zoom in on you, and you, when you're new, you know, it, it, it's a lot of pressure. Yeah. To, uh, did you, or are you afraid you're going to forget your line or blow it? Or... And you want to be interesting. Yeah. You want to be interesting. Yeah. Maybe Mark. they'll, maybe they'll, yeah, I'm going to say that line so that they go, let's give that guy some more lines. Always. It's yeah. always some terrible. I know. If you walk around at the, t I, I'm awful. I'm always like, oh, I know that guy's in movies, so can I sit here? <laughs> always have the, it's, <laughs> you know, I was thinking, maybe my character, uh, right. you're always pitching. Yeah, I, I'll see you, see you after lunch, yeah. Eliana. She has a twin sister. Yeah, maybe I know she can... gets killed in the scene, but she has a twin sister. <laughs> <laughs> that's always the that's the that's the the life raft for the actor. It's the evil twin. Yeah, I do. The uh, well, it's so funny. I, I always think of you from so many serious. Uh, did you get to do in any comedies or in the beginning? I just think of you as like drama, drama, drama. But you know, when I met you in uh, Rough Ride, when we met on Rough Riders, I mean, you were very funny. So it's interesting. Well, I'm silly, but nobody will <laughs> let me be silly. They really. I, it's so funny. They, that, that's not happening. You're, you're a wild man. They would not let me do that. I would literally go in, and casting directors would go, "Hey, nice to see you," and I would go, "This is yeah." And so you would go in for a comedy. 
yeah, a couple times, and oh. then it was just sort of the thing where my my old manager said, they, they just don't, they don't, they don't see it, they don't see it, they don't see you that way, and so I just thought, okay, fine. I mean, thankfully, over the years, some of the roles that I've had, even in, you know, very serious, yeah, that they're I've been able to bring some levity, yes, not for some sort of subconscious level to try to go see, I can be funny, right. I mean, Bosch has, he has a, he has a sense of humor. Right. Because I would always say, you know, that, that thing of being humorless is mm -hmm. it's not fun. Well, we were, ta I was talking in the last show about uh, one of my favorite actors, Gene Hackman, and how yeah. just, he's, every character is, he's sort of inherently unlikable, and yet you, you love him, yeah. and he had puts the humor and little... I mean, he, you can't take your eyes off no. him when you're in, in a movie. And even in the most serious movie, he's doing something that's funny or interesting. But you don't think of him as he's not funny. No, but he, yeah, he's a rare. Just the way he laughs he's a creature. is frightening. <laughs> like, yeah, and when he smiles, you know, he has that twinkle in his eye. That, yeah. that there's always something beneath that. E right. Even when he's playing kind of scary guys. Yeah. There's always just something about him. He's, you know, one of the greats. But then when you let him be funny, he's hysterically funny. Yeah. Just pissing your pants funny. Um, but he's well, one of those guys that, that, that does that. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe that's one of the, you know, as the show progresses, you could start to incorporate your juggling act. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, Any, I'm shameless. I want to go, we're going to get to Bosch at, in a minute and so many other things, but I must take you back to the set of Rough Riders because we were talking at the beginning and I said that that was the craziest set, aside from Alive, which we shot on a mountain. Right. And uh, it was supposed to be, I don't know, three months and, you know, at five months, yeah. I, I mean, I don't, I can't remember anything <laughs> completely. We were out of our minds. I was talking about a three-day weekend that involved mushrooms and four other actors and, you know. An actor prepares. Yeah. And uh, I, I ate alligator. I, you know, like everything. It was a crazy weekend. But and but getting in Rough Riders, I was the only, I think I, I, I and I, my joke to Milius was always, am I the only girl on the set who's not a stripper? Yeah. Because there were so many. I know. There was like a local club. Yeah. But Gary, do you recall that Gary, back me up, he had twin strippers visiting him on the set. Mm -hmm. And I and <laughs> Brian Keith. May rest in peace. Yeah. They were trying to do a scene and walking down a hall. And Gary kept leaving. Or he said, "If I walk down this hall one more time, it's going to kill me." Yeah. And I remember what a cast. I mean, that was, was like, almost like an Irwin Allen cast because we had Tom Berenger, Berenger, Sam Elliott, the yeah. coolest, sexiest, handsome man on the planet. With a yeah. William Cat. Yeah. Um. Chris Noth, yourself. Chris, Chris Noth, Arlie Brad, Ermey. Brad uh, Johnson. Right, Brad. Brad Johnson. Yep. And James Parks and Mark Moses and oh, Mark Moses and and George Hamilton. Yes. Nick wow. Chinlin. Brian I mean, Keith, yeah. Brian Keith, and he he. Nick Chinlin, who I knew he, back from New died. York theater. Yeah. Um, you were the only. I was telling actually, I was telling a story out there. That's right. It's in my contract. We did this whole. <laughs> you know, it was this be. testosterone fuel. The two Vietnam guy. The two. Dale Dye. Oh yeah, Captain Dale Dye, and then Marshall, oh, God. who had been a, a seal, yeah. a frogman in Vietnam, and uh, it was this just balls out testosterone thing. And then we get to the end of the film, and you come on the set, and nobody is seen or interacted with a female <laughs> other than these kind of like half-wit strippers that they would cast to roll cigars on their naked thighs in the scene with, <laughs> yeah. with George because Hamilton. Because why not? Yeah, uh, it, it was bizarre. It, it was bizarre. And then you came on the set, and everybody was like, hi, hi, hi. It was like we'd all been was... at war and had come home, <laughs> and you were the first female very that we popular. interacted with. You were very popular. Yeah, you were. But you even had this sort of expression of sort of, enjoying it and huh. thinking that it was kind of funny but also kind of being like yeah 
Yeah. Okay, I get it. I get it. I get it. I just yeah. want a Rice Krispies treat and I want a wrap. Okay. I'm there tired. was a an, an actor who shall go unnamed. Uh, was it was ardently pursuing me and uh, would not stop and would call me every night. And she, you really are not gonna. No, I can't. I can't. Uh, and uh, out there, <laughs> and it I'm was, just gonna. <laughs> it was relentless. It was relentless. And I, he was like, "You really? I can't come to your room." No, you can't. Yeah, I hung up. And literally, the phone rang again. I pick up the phone. It's so hard not to say his name. I pick up the phone, uh, and he goes, "Tell me the truth. Am I hanging on to the bumper at this point?" And that became like literally my favorite. Line hanging on to the bumper. I'm, I'm hanging on to the bumper at this point. I'm like, yes, you are. And if there's no snow on the ground, that's not fun. <laughs> we not call us. that skitching. You back need east. to. You need to. Did you go boar hunting with? Uh... No, I didn't do any of that. Oh God, stuff. I, I was... didn't go to the strip clubs. I didn't. I, you know, I because I didn't drink. Yeah. I, I smoked enormous amounts of marijuana on that film, mm -hmm. um, and I went kind of native, because we had all those Indian guys. Yeah. Uh, who were, who were a lot of fun to kind of hang out with. But I always felt like it was sort of John's, yeah, John's vision. Uh, 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 he wanted to do Apocalypse Now, but he sort of set it in the, in the Spanish American War. Yeah, with TNT. And the... I went native. I went fully native. I remember yeah. I came in and I was playing B. F. Goodrich, and and uh, as the film progressed, I started wearing more and more. Indian stuff. I had a silver <laughs> Indian bracelet, and you know, I was sort of like the the Lance character in Apocalypse, the surfer guy. Yeah. And Milius was all, and every time because we were so behind schedule, you oh. have to cut a line of my dialogue or a yeah. scene. He would say, "I'll give you a great kill," which he did. He delivered on it. I, I there's a, a moment where this we're charging through the the wire at San Juan Hill, and the Spaniard tries to. Surrender, and I say, "He that hath no stomach, let him, for this fight, let him depart." And I shoot him in the face. I quote Shakespeare and shoot him in the face in cold blood. Yeah. And after John said, "That must have been arousing for you." <laughs> yeah. Okay, John. Yeah. <laughs> go back. I'm gonna go get some more goldfish at Crafty, go. and I'll, I'll be back. <laughs> but what a what a brilliant man! I mean, just such a. To be in his presence, I, you know, he's such a savant and and uh, with everything, art, literature, film. Yeah. I would just sit at his feet like a child, listening to him. Yeah. Such a brilliant guy yeah. and and charming and and fun and game and didn't care, didn't give a shit. Those Turner executives would come and try to bullwhip him back in, and I think one time he pulled his pistol out and shot three monitors. Yeah, that's John. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and there and guys were carrying real guns on the set. Oh things yeah, like that. And we yeah. we'd shoot rattlesnakes at the. I mean, it was it was madness. But well, that's why I say we're there rare over Thanksgiving, and there was like a. I had gotten there just in. He goes, "Oh, good, you're, you're, we're gonna go boar we're hunting." hunting. <laughs> like I'm like, how did I get the jeep in the wilds of Texas? You know what I'm, or you know, like I'm trying to act like this is totally normal. You know. <laughs> <laughs> It was insane. I know. And then he'd go to these real, he'd want to take me to these steak, you know, and then at night, this is back when I ate meat, so, you know, and then at night, very refined, the finest steakhouse yeah. with the finest wine and cigars, and then I'd hear hear a lot of great stories in the, the, the DP. Um, oh, Tony Richardson. Tony Richardson. Who was married to Jacqueline Bissett. Yeah. No, no, not Jacqueline Bissett. Uh, the other one who was a Charlie Angel, Charlie, um, Charlie's Angels, the... The dark-haired angel. Oh, Jacqueline, is it her? Jack, yeah, I can't, God, we're, I can't remember. We're going nuts. Oh my God! But uh, I thought he was married to Rebecca De Mornay also at one point. Maybe I don't know. Smith. But he, Jacqueline he, Smith. Jacqueline Smith. Jacqueline Smith. And he did. Uh, don't look. I believe he shot. Don't look yeah. now. He was. He was an interesting guy. All he I ever heard him say too. was, "Put on a longer lens." <laughs> But he was one of those guys. He, you know, he was in London in the in the swing and sixties. Yeah, 60s been a big drinker. Great story. He Crazy did. Crazy stories. He did. Crazy stories. So we can do that. All right. So I want to get to, of course, uh, you're very lucky. To, it's so important to have mentors in this business, and your sort of your biggest mentor has been David Milch, yeah. and how he really, I mean, that really changed. I mean, that just 
you must be able to sleep at night <laughs> just going, I'll just call David and see what he has to say. But how, how did you meet him? And, you know, how did your friendship come about? Well, he, there, uh, I got a call from my manager saying that they wanted me to come in and read for a role on NYPD Blue. And I was a fan of the show. And mm -hmm. um, I thought, oh, cool, it's going to be some detective guy. And he said, no, actually, it's a doctor. I went, what? They're never good. <laughs> They don't. They they never cast me as the doctor. I'm the guy. I'm the New York guy. I'm the hard edge guy. And he's. Well, that's what they want to read you for. So, I kind of cleaned myself up. I remember I actually parted my hair, and had was wearing my reading glasses and a button down shirt. And I went in to read for this role, mm -hmm. and um, it was Botchko and Milch and Mark Tinker, and did it. And they said great. And Milch said. Um, uh, would you like this part? And I said, <laughs> very much so. And he said, well, the part is yours. And I, of course, you know, that had never happened to me before in my yeah. career. And I was thrilled. And as I was leaving, he said, and don't forget to call your mom and dad. <laughs> and then I got on the set and shot the episode. And it was a great experience. And I just sort of watched David kind of coming in and mm -hmm. changing things. And then it turned into this gig where I would get a call sort of every few months. They need you to come in and prescribe Viagra for Sipowitz, or <laughs> this character has early onset of Alzheimer's. And mm -hmm. so Jimmy Smits would, you know, introduce me to this ex pug and mm -hmm. he would say, I think he's got problems. And then I would kind of eyeball it and sort of save the day. And he was this sort of interesting mm -hmm. character who wasn't a, uh, a badass or a tough guy and it kind of changed things that mm -hmm. the the that first episode came out and suddenly I was getting calls to play other doctors which mm -hmm. I would say no I don't want to play another doctor I mm -hmm. that, that's here but lawyers and and just so I, I kind of moved away from playing the heavies all the time right and then um, I don't know a year or so later um, I just finished a film and I had my hair was you know down to my shoulders and I had a huge beard and I was uh, on the Fox lot and um, auditioning for something, walking along and there was Milch on his bicycle riding by, and I went David, David, Mr. Milch, and he sort of he did a little <laughs> like spin out like like you did when you were a kid trying to make your bike yeah. skid, he kind of skidded and I said. It's it's Titus Welliver, and he said, "Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you were the deer hunter." <laughs> um, <laughs> ah, which, and then he funny. he uh, he said, "I'm glad I'm running into you. This is serendipitous because I'm doing a new series. Uh, would you consider doing a series?" And of course, I said, "Are you kidding me? Yeah, absolutely." And it was Brooklyn South, mm -hmm. and so I did that series, and and in the. Um, in the process of making that series, it turned out that uh, David had gone to Yale and he was there and his wife Rita had also gone to Yale and mm -hmm. we knew so many of the same people because my dad had run the grad school of fine arts at Yale mm -hmm. that he'd sort of been handed that from Albers who had been his mentor and Rita was there in the art school and Dave of course has his crazy Yale stories, you know, he was skull and bones and got booted out of the law school because he was shooting, he was he was <laughs> tripping on acid and, and was shooting streetlights out in New Haven. And I, but he knew my, my godfather, who was the, the, the novelist and screenwriter, Terry Southern, they, mm -hmm. they had been very close, and Robert Penn Warren, um, and uh, the poet Mark Strand, and these were all people that were in my life as a kid. And so we sort of bonded with that. But I think also, um, David kind of recognized this sort of like-minded craziness in mm -hmm. me that I was, that I was sort of, um, I think he saw a bit of himself in me, that I mm -hmm. was a bit of a tornado and somewhat self-destructive. Um, and he, he took a shine to me and he became kind of a surrogate father to me mm -hmm. um, because he was a, although I had, I had a dialogue with my father. There were certainly things that I could not really discuss with my father comfortably. Whereas I could go to David with anything, mm -hmm. and he would never judge or um, 
shun me um, and would typically would sort of talk me out of some really bad ideas and, <laughs> and some he tried to talk me out of and I went ahead and did it anyway. But he, um, and I just learned a tremendous amount from him mm -hmm. in the same way that I did from my father. I would, David would, uh, we would sit and have conversations sometimes for hours and of course I'd just observe him on the set and the way that he just, it, there's something contagious about someone who has a, a tremendous hunger for knowledge mm -hmm. and also has this enormous mind that is filled with knowledge. And um, so for me, I, I was um, just always kind of watching him. Dave, I used to say, Dave, you're like an aquarium. There's always something going on with you. <laughs> wow. and, so I then went and did another series with him after Brooklyn South. We did Big Apple, which was short-lived, but a great experience. And again, um, an amazing cast of actors with uh, David Strathairn and Michael Madsen and Donnie Wahlberg and Kim Dickens and Ed O'Neill and Jeffrey Pierce and um, just this, uh, and Glenn Turman, uh, all these incredible actors. Um, I mean, Chris Messina came on and did like you know, four lines in a scene, um, mm -hmm. Yule Vasquez, just all these people, because it was the sort of a hot ticket in town. And then eventually went on to do Deadwood that we mm -hmm. did for three seasons. And so it just always seemed, and David, those those gigs kind of always came along when I was, you know, last, down to my last hundred dollars and, and thinking about leaving the business, feeling disenfranchised, yeah. and then the phone would ring and I know. I feel like I saw you at an audition in that period, and again, I was just like, so, so sad. I, I hate auditioning. I'm not good at auditioning, because it's like I I go in the room and I go, you know, Cameron Mannheim's out there, and you should just go with her. <laughs> like I I undermine myself. I just like Francis Fisher sitting there. Yeah. <laughs> you just go with her. I can't even. Get, I can't do it, you know. But it, like, I would walk out. I'd spend more time. I always spent more time in the waiting right. room. Hold on, I'm I, no Titus. I'm just gonna. I'll be in in a minute. I have very little concern about an audition. I don't know. I should be more. Uh, yeah, they're hard. I mean, it's hard. It's no matter it's what. It's too tough. It's it is tough, and there's no real science to it. I'm, yeah, I'm always sort of saying that to actors when they're coming up what's the did you take an auditioning class and i went jesus christ no i mean i just uh, yeah you know you it's have to tough. kind of pick and choose the ones that mean something to you and that mm -hmm. that you really feel like you can can get and it's not yeah. that you should ever half-ass anything but you know it's it's a fool's errand to a certain degree because yeah. as we know at you know there there's that mystery but being on both sides of the table all you want is the person to walk through the door. Yeah. And you hope that they have a modicum of talent because mm -hmm. you want them to physically represent that idea right. and be good. Yeah. And, um, you know, I, I, as I'm sure, you know, I've gone in and there's been 25 blonde guys. Right. That look like surfers. And it's, a, it's supposed to be a New York cop from the Bronx. <laughs> and you're going like, gee, I don't see a lot of those. Aryan, you know, Norse type characters, uh, you know, working the beat in the yeah. Bronx. Uh, I want to get to Deadwood, but of course you mentioned that Terry Southern, the great writer, Terry Southern, uh, a part of Easy Rider, yeah. uh, was your godfather. How did that come about? My goodness. And who did you meet through Terry Southern? A lot of people. He was, he was one of my father's closest friends. Is this in Connecticut? Yeah, in wow, Connecticut. Wow, I didn't even know he lived in Connecticut. So... As a kid, I had this sort of rarefied upbringing where we would go to Uncle Terry's for Thanksgiving or for Easter, mm -hmm. and, and and there would be all of the Beatles or a couple of the Beatles and Peter Sellers and Peter Fonda and, and Hopper and Rip Torn and, um, and George Plimpton and um, all these all these people. And as mm -hmm. a kid, of course, I you know I was aware of who a lot of them were, but they were just kind of regular people. Mm -hmm. And um, so actually a funny story about that. I We had show and tell after the Thanksgiving weekend and we'd gone to Terry's and um, I sat there and John Lennon played his guitar. And so it was the show and tell thing. And mm -hmm. so you get up and go, oh, I went to my grandmother's <laughs> house and we had, I, we got extra pie because we were good. And, 
And I said, oh, well, I went to my Uncle Terry's and John Lennon was there and he was playing his guitar and he let me, let me sing songs with him and he was nice and the teacher was said, sit down, we don't lie and show and tell, and completely <laughs> humiliated me. And I wasn't telling it, uh, in, in, you know, yeah. I, I wasn't being a braggart. I was just answering the question, what did you do? And uh, of course my father was furious and he called Terry and told him what happened. And, and John, uh, alas, I no longer have the, this little letter oh. written, but to the school, because my father's house burnt down and that letter was, was a casualty of that. But the letter went to the school, to the teacher, to say you 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 owe him an apology. Wow, which is kind of cool because you know he was John Lennon. He didn't yeah. really need to do. But the idea that someone would humiliate a child. Yeah, he had a shitty childhood, but that someone would do that just incensed him, and so he took that time to sort of. You well, know. that's Connecticut. <laughs> that, <laughs> sounds like, that sounds like every experience I ever had in yeah. Connecticut. <laughs> Stop being creative. Yeah. you know. Yeah. Stop yeah. it conform yeah not you know. happening yeah but yeah. it's good in a way it gives you a, a a tremendous insight into human nature and you know so i you know i don't some of those but some of those experiences of, of connecticut and the restrictions of the personalities um well it's it's kind of disarming or alarming to a teacher when you're like 11 years old and you start talking about Boon, yeah. Boonwell. <laughs> my dad took me to a picture and there were dead goats and a woman got her eye sliced open with a razor blade oh, yeah. right and the teacher would just you know the, and then that note would go home yes know, and my father would go oh jesus christ these idiots you know? yeah I I'll, had that, I'll call the school we i remember we were doing my friend uh howard and i we were we drew um greek god we thought we were you know we were doing greek gods and so I, we drew all these murals and believe it or not we got in a lot of trouble for <laughs> drawing their private parts not even you know it wasn't like scrawled but it was like a reference right. to breasts and the and and there was this big thing where I, I kid you not like a little kid where we were gonna have to cut out you know fig leaves How and ridiculous. and put them on and again like you said it was one of these like just the unfairness of it and the fact that as artists and young you know we were we were so proud like doing this thing not for extra credit oh. and then it got stomped on yeah. with like you're dirty and yeah. you're you're bad you're bad kids and that we were trying that there was this inference that we were trying to be disruptive right and what and what we're doing so that's that's Connecticut yeah but oh, I'd say always good to be disruptive I know and put it put in your back pocket for future acting so then so how quickly were you on deadwood that it does it become a phenomenon i i mean i sort of recall right out of the gate it was just like yeah it it did kind of come out of the gate that way i mean suddenly i mean david went to do a screening at yale call and i at that point had left la and was living back in greenwich connecticut mm -hmm. w with my ex-wife and our two sons and he he called me up out of the blue and said, "I'm gonna I'm gonna screen um, the pilot of Deadwood, but I'm gonna talk to the writing and some of the acting students, and I thought maybe you'd come up and meet me there, and you can sort of talk about the process of because you've worked with me on other shows." Mm -hmm. um, which I said, "Yeah," but I did not. I hadn't done Deadwood at that point because, mm -hmm. of course, it was the pilot, and then David. Um, said, I want you to come and do do something, and so he created that character of of Adams mm -hmm. for me to play, and it was sort of, um, you know, he sort of made it up. Ultimately, he wasn't he wasn't a character like so many of the other characters that were actually you know historical figures mm -hmm. in, in in Deadwood, um, and um, and and allowed me to give the character. My older brother uh, Silas had passed away, and so David said. We, we got to come up with a name for this guy. And I said, you know, it would be a great tribute to my brother Silas, who I love so dearly, to mm -hmm. give, him, give him that name. And, and uh, David said, absolutely, and it worked out really well. So, um, but, you know, when you were on, and once again, you know, he assembled this incredible cast of actors. And, uh, you know, as the, the Hollywood lore, which is, which is true, is that a lot of times we would not have completed... Um, scripts and or scenes and so I'd get a call at 
you know, 11 o'clock at night and they'd say, we need you here at six in the morning. We don't know what you're doing. We know it's a scene with you and Ian McShane um, and Earl Brown. Don't know what you're saying. Don't know how many pages it's going to be, but just be here. Suit it. So that's what you do. You would kind right. of get there and suit up and mm -hmm. then sit in your trailer sometimes for hours on end waiting for pages. And there were days where you would sit for 11 hours and thank God we had Xbox. We would just sit in my trailer and play Xbox. And then you'd go home with having done nothing. But And did you ever, you were friends, so did you ever say, David, what's going on? Or no, you because just, that's you just the way that David, the boundaries. That, I mean, I, I learned that from, <laughs> from do, going back to NYPD Blue. That's the, right. the, that was the way that David worked. And so for me, it became a way of working that I, what it forced me to do was to become a quick study. Mm -hmm. Because you can't improvise or deviate from what's on the page or it doesn't work. I mean, there's right. a reason, you know, you wait for David's words because they're the best words you're going to get to say. Um, and I think it made me a better actor. It, it made it, you know, I got, I was able to sort of divorce myself enough to be able to look at, look at a scene, kind of figure it out and learn it and not be in my head with mm -hmm. a bunch of horseshit that was stuff that wasn't actable. Um, but to just sort of, you know, trust in, in the good words that were on the page and allow that to kind of inform the performance. Mm -hmm. And so I, it, um, I understood it completely and I embraced it. And, but I saw a lot of actors that it was, that it, it scared the shit out of them. I, a few years ago, uh, Brian Cranston had been on Brooklyn South and uh, we were doing Argo and we hadn't seen each other in years. And uh, he said that was that was the the worst experience of, of my career, not because I didn't enjoy the cast and I didn't like the directors and and the ultimate uh, end, which was David's great writing, mm -hmm. but not having the material, having time with the material that was not a way that I was comfortable working, mm -hmm. and I hated it and it and it terrified me and I, I didn't enjoy it. Right. And. Um, he said, you've done all these shows with David. How do you, well, why do you keep going back? I, aside from the fact that, that, you know, the end result is a, is a fantastic show and, mm -hmm. and David's the, the greatest writer. And I just said, it's just because I've learned how to work that way. So for me, yeah. I, you know, I, um, when I would go and do other jobs where you would have, the, you know, scripts in advance and, right. and they would pretty much stay the same and there'd be minor rewrites and you'd get the pages a day or two <laughs> Before you'd have to even shoot the scene, I yeah, go, this is easy. <laughs> this is so easy, but I kind of liked that way of working and being sort of on the edge and kind of going, well, I'm just I'm going to do this. I'm going right. to learn it, and then you work. You know, you sit across a table from someone like Ian McShane, completely unflappable, you know, Jedi mm -hmm. master of acting, who would have a three-page soliloquy to a decapitated Indian's head while he's getting a blowjob. <laughs> and he'd get the pages at one o'clock in the morning and then show up and uh, start shooting at six and yeah. do two takes and not miss a word. And you kind of go, well, uh, you know. Yeah. At, at the feet of a master, you just sort of, you kind of, I, I learned a lot from, from that. Yeah. And I still work that way, even though we, we have our, we get our scripts well in advance on Bosch no issues with that things can change mm -hmm. I sometimes kind of look over things and talk to the writers and say are you are you okay with this maybe this or that or mm -hmm. a lot of times it's just it's sort of there on the day we'll change things up a little bit but we have you know I have those those scripts and yet I still sort of hold to that thing of because that's when I learn my dialogue for the next day is my my tiny little one hour or sometimes half hour lunch break the day before Right. Sit there and shovel food in for that time and just learn the lines by rote and then forget it. And yeah. then go in and come in and shoot the stuff the next day. But yeah, I could see that could be a lot of pressure. And then the, the other person who uh, you just mentioned who you've worked with again and again is uh, Ben Affleck. Are you his uh, lucky? Uh, I'm his rabbit's foot. Rabbit's foot. How did that, how did you meet, uh, how did you meet Ben? How did that? 
Did you just audition for his yep. first? I auditioned. I went on tape for Gone Baby Gone, and I was shooting Deadwood at the time. So I had, you know, long, long hair and a giant beard again. <laughs> and um, I read it must the script. be great when you're traveling, incidentally. But. Well, no, that was that was the because you know it was it was the post 9/11 thing, yeah. and so um, yeah, I got hassled all because <laughs> I was flying from L.A. back east to Connecticut to see my sons. Right. And every time TSA, mm. you know. Yeah. It was. Anyway, I mean, yeah, it was not fun. But um, so sorry. Yes, ben no. So I read the script, and the role was originally written for a guy about ten to fifteen years older than than I was. Mm -hmm. But I didn't care because I thought the script was so good, and I thought, what's the worst that can happen? I'll just go in. And so they put me on tape, and then I didn't hear anything. It seemed like for months, mm -hmm. and then my manager called me and said, "Oh, they're going to do callbacks next week for Gone Baby Gone." And I said, "I thought that." sailed I didn't, mm. and he said no 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 Ben's just been location scouting and been working on the script and so now it's time mm -hmm. to, to get down to that and uh, I went in and and met him and um, he said I, uh, I saw your audition I saw your tape and I really liked it and so let's let's just uh, jump in and do it and, and I said something like okay yeah I'll, we'll just do it and he sort of looked at me and said Where's your, where's your accent? And I said, what accent? He said, your Boston accent. I said, I'm, I'm, I'm from New York. I'm not. I'm from New York and Connecticut. I'm, and he said, I, oh, I thought you were from, from Boston. <laughs> I said, no, no, it's just for the audition. <laughs> so I got kind of lucky. Ah. Did it, and of course, it was one of those things. I was in the waiting room going in to see him, and there was, there were guys like Robert Joy and and um, uh, Ted Levine, all these guys who I have you know great respect for but yeah. they're a few years older than I am and I thought oh shit man it's I hate that I'm gonna go in and read for this thing and really want it and I'm just not old enough to play the part mm -hmm. so I was lucky and I got the part and we you know Ben is uh he's one of those directors that just sort of he hires people you know with the idea that they know what they're doing and that mm -hmm. he doesn't have to tell them what to do. I mean, it's not that he doesn't give direction sometimes. Right. But typically with him, it's just sort of, you want to try something different, and that's kind of it. It's sort mm -hmm. of a free one. Do you want to just do something completely off the wall that mm -hmm. may or may not work? Sure. And then, um, and then I went and did The Town with him after that, and Argo, although I have a big bone to pick with him because it seems that the, the roles that I'm doing in his films are, are getting smaller and smaller <laughs> and smaller. I mean, by the, I did Live By Night. I had two yeah. little scenes, but I'm, you just see me get my head blown off in a yeah, barber chair. Yeah, I know. Um, so I, gotta, I have a bone to pick with that. I got to I gotta talk to him. Well, maybe it's, maybe it's in the editing process. Um, and so when you're working with somebody like Ben, uh, well, in these other movies too, how... You started out really as an organic actor. What, what, at what point do technical things like the camera and learning the camera and using the camera alter your uh, performances and you, utilizing that? You know, knowing how to fill the space yeah. is something, again, it's unteachable. Yeah, and they don't. I mean, obviously, they don't teach that at in drama Very school. Very important. They don't teach you how to act in front of a camera. Yeah. And, it's, and so it becomes one of those things. And I think when I first sort of felt the need to do that was act on Brooklyn South and our DP on that show was a guy named Bill Rowe and so I would come over and say can I look through the little mm. thing and I just want to see what it looks like and because I expressed some interest and I thought I'm just going to get shot down they're too busy they don't want a goddamn actor getting in the way <laughs> but can he I was very look? he was very sweet and yeah. so he um, hooked me up to go over to Panavision Hollywood and he said, if you're really interested in this, go over there and they'll just show you lenses and things like that. So I, I just kind of went over as a, one afternoon as a layman and just played around and looked at lenses and got a sense of, you know, what was the, the, the space in which you could mm -hmm. operate in. And, um, and I think it's invaluable. I mean, I always yeah. say, why isn't somebody come up with with that class because I think every mm -hmm. actor would benefit and that's what you would do Very it's much. a technical medium and you just sort of you know you throw on an 85 right and go okay 
Now go get in front of the camera. We're going to show you what what you right. look, you know where you play and where you don't play. And this is 150 millimeters, so don't sneeze. Right. Um, but you don't learn that. No. You learn it on the job, right? Do you it have is. a favorite uh, lens? I always I have my. I favorite. know you. You have, you like the 150, don't you? Well, you go I, buck and a half. I like doing fun. Like, I, I like getting into, the, you know, like working with Marty so much. Okay, now you're going to look at that styrofoam, and yeah. he's not even going to be here, and you're going to slowly turn. You know, but I kind of like stuff like that. Yeah, but that's... Acting on a dime. And, but that's that whole... That's I hate the 50. That that's my least favorite lens yeah. is a 50, because yeah. I just think you're, there's nothing you can do with it. No, and I hate it. And it's they, overrated and, and overused. So when I cringe when when I know something dies inside me when when they're throw when they throw up the 50 and I always over my shoulder and they're always surprised I go C go with a 30. Yeah. <laughs> and they laugh a little bit, you know. I hate the 50 cuz they know that you know. But go, that's go with, the Come on, go with the 30. It's just a little looser. Come on. Cuz I just the 50 is like Yeah. But that's the dance. I mean, and you know? that's the kind of the beauty and the fun. Um I love it. I is, love is having that relationship also yeah. with the DP. Um, I love knowing what the frame is yeah. and how, how much can you see and can you see me doing this and you know wh how much of the room can we see? I my whole heart sinks sometimes when you're like, oh, it's just a set. And right. They want you to come in and have pour coffee and start the scene. You know, and there's so many things you can do. And in getting ready for the interview, I was watching a lot of the Bosch episodes, and it was so nice to see how much the frame is yeah. uh, is utilized and how much the police station yeah. is uh, is utilized. Um, so well, we have we shoot that show more like a feature film because we yeah. have great DPs, and LA is really the central Makes character. It fun. Yeah. So they have the luxury. Of not having to do the sort of standard coverage of of television with a master and then a medium and then come in and do over the shoulder, you know, coverage. Mm -hmm. they, I mean, there there are sometimes there are great shots that are that are dolly things and we we move along and then we let the let it land and let the scene play there and don't yeah. come in and do a bunch of stuff, which I like because it really is mm -hmm. we make you know ten one hour films for that yeah. show. And it's um, it's still the same kind of breakneck pace of television, right? But it feels more visually. It's it's, it's it has a nice look, a kind of a film noir. Yeah. Uh, uh, did you watch any film noirs beforehand? Well, I'm a fan of that, so I you know. You're a Robert Mitchum fan, right? Oh yeah. See your yeah. see your guy. Did you ever meet him? No, not. To sit and talk with him, but yeah, to I meet him, him and 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 Great guy. kind of be there. And he was very, very, he was very sweet with me. But I was yeah. kind of, I was a little bit shy, and so I didn't. But I, um, I talked to him about one of my favorite films that he did, which I call his King Lear, which is a a, a Boston film called The Friends of Eddie Coyle. Uh huh. And uh, he plays a plays kind of a down and out sort of loser in it. And, yeah. And he's amazing in the film, and he. Uh, and also, he had shot Ryan's daughter in um, the village where um, my family has a home in Ireland. Oh. And so they were great. So that yeah. was a little bit of the... But then I got kind of shy. But he was very gracious. And, yeah. and actually, he he would... I think he was kind of sort of... As I kind of backed off and went, well, I, I, I don't want to take any more of your time. I think he was sort of like... Hey, I'll kill Hey, kid, you know, you started this fucking conversation. <laughs> <laughs> why, why are you leaving now? Uh, um, but yeah, he's a he. I mean, I I've said to people, you know, if if uh, you know, Mitchum would have made a great Harry Bosch. He mm -hmm. he really would have been a really good Harry Bosch. Yeah, because he had all he has all that that sort of stuff that's mm -hmm. not necessarily um, you know integral to a noir character per se, but right. Just, you know, there there was Mitchum. Could he he could be really still mm -hmm. and not not do a tremendous amount, but you knew what was going on, right? And he didn't he didn't have to he didn't telegraph things mm -hmm. necessarily with dialogue, 
there was a great stillness. So in that way, I learned a lot from, from him. As, as well, I think one of the, I love noirs, and one of the things that can help you out, again, in knowing not just the, the acting is just, oh, there's going to be rain in this yeah. scene. So I don't really have to do a lot. So let the rain do its job. Or Tell let, the story. Yeah, let the shadows. And, uh, but that takes a long time, that kind of confidence, I yeah, think. Yeah, it's... There's also the um, when you yeah when you create that sort of a backdrop and you know the the other side of that is that I, when when the man my manager told me that it was was Bosch and he said you know it's that it's that great series of books and I'd only read one book mm -hmm. many years before that but when I got the script I started rifling through to see how many things were night exterior because <laughs> that's that's you know i'll read scripts down and go night exterior night exterior and i go not for me not for me yeah I'm not built that way anymore it's not that i'm old or anything like that but that just kind of wears you slick in a yeah. quickly so we we do a fair amount of it yeah but we don't rely um you know solely on the night of la but certainly LA itself. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, and it's the, you know, it's the LA that you've seen um, in, in noir flicks, but not necessarily on, on LA TV. It's not Santa Monica. It's not, you right. know, it's not umbrella drinks and things like that. I mean, Harry goes to really some funky, funky places, which yeah, it's is the, the fun LA, the long goodbye. Yeah, yeah exactly. Fun LA. You but know? it's that great metaphor, you know, it's the, yeah. it's the thing of the, of, the shininess and, and the beauty of LA and beneath mm -hmm. that is this really seedy sort of morally depraved kind of yeah. world and that's the world that he inhabits mm -hmm. for his work so it's interesting and how do you keep it fresh so that you're not because I think that being a carrying a show being the lead of the show it has its own inherent pressures with like you're there and you drive to the set and blah, 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 put on the coat and how do you keep it is there do you think about that I don't honestly maybe part of that is just that I I like the character mm -hmm. so much and always sort of like to get a uh, a peek at where they're going to take this guy and where where he's going to go, and we you know we we have discussions about that, um, but it is kind of that thing, and, and and I'm thankful that I still have that kind of that I'm not jaded that I have that kind of gratitude and appreciation of having a a great gig that a it's a fantastic character that mm -hmm. stimulates me because that was for me always the thing that terrified me was well, to sign on to do a show, and what if it would sustain me artistically and intellectually without sounding too terribly pretentious so mm -hmm. that I would I could go the duration right and because I and I'm sure you have too. you go on you go on to shows and you see actors that are in their their fifth and sixth and seventh yeah. season and David Crusoe and they don't Take your and they hate it and, <laughs> and they hate it and they're fighting with the writers and the producers right. And it's unpleasant, and actors aren't speaking to each other. Yeah. yeah. And I thought I I don't want to I, I don't want to do that, and we don't have any of that at mm -hmm. all. Um, and I'm ex I'm genuinely excited to get up at you know 4:30 every morning more or less, and and go and work those long ass hours. But it's a great crew, and it's you know fantastic writing, and really great actors that I get to work with. Yeah. And uh, and people that I've worked with before, Paul Calderon came on the season, mm -hmm. and Spencer Garrett, and Brooke Smith, and these are all people who are dear friends of mine. Mm -hmm. You know that uh, you know their resumes and and um, are long and impressive. And there's nothing more fun than working with someone that you know and mm -hmm. you love and you have great respect for because there's that great ease and that sense yeah. of play. And then you end up doing the scene, you go, <laughs> yes, wow. Well. You, uh, so my, uh, unfortunately, we, we're running out of time, but uh, the last question I wanted to ask you is that you're, you're a dad, and how much does being a, a dad change? How's that, how's that sort of changed your acting? Did it change it in any way? Well, I think it changed me not just as an actor, but certainly as, as an adult. I suddenly mm -hmm. realized that, that uh, my priorities were, were really solely my children and their well-being and and uh and uh providing for them mm -hmm. um and because as actors as we 
you know, the more we do this, certainly in the early stages, you've got someone who's a little more seasoned and, and they talk, you know, they start talking about guild regulations and, and forced calls and billing <laughs> and all this stuff. And, yeah. I, and when my first child was born, and I, it's not that I was preoccupied with that, but those things would kind of come into my mind, mm -hmm. certainly in the negotiating phase of work. And, you know, my attitude after that was kind of just make it fair and yeah. equitable. And and if it's a good if it's a good role something interesting I'll go and do it. Mm -hmm. um, and I kind of forgot about all that and it was liberating because I didn't uh, I didn't I didn't I just didn't think about it anymore. Mm -hmm. it, and and truthfully, the way I work now is that I, and I say this to people I go we're all here to do the same thing which is to come in and do our work and do it well, but get home, mm -hmm. get home and and be with our loved ones. And uh, that's kind of it. Mm -hmm. And and in that way, being being a father is that it it, it 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 to go back to Sandy. It took all of the attention off of myself and put it on my children. And right. that for me is, um, you know, and and what's wonderful is that my two of my three kids have been on the show. My son Quinn, who's fifteen, plays mm -hmm. young Harry Bosch. So he plays me in the flashbacks. Wow. And mm -hmm. my daughter Cora, who's eleven, came on and did a little scene last season. And and eventually, my 18-year-old um, boy, Eamon, will cook because they're all actors. Oh boy, they're all actors. You couldn't you couldn't get that out of their system. No, because they kind of grew up on sets, and yeah. they have sort of the same sort of experience that yeah. I think you and I share. Is that we were exposed to literature and music and right. film and dance and and all and, and art. Mm -hmm. And when you grow up that way you you tend to gravitate towards yeah. it. it's not because it's what you know mm -hmm. it's because it's what makes you grow it's it's sort of it's it's sustenance yeah you know it's a it's a it's a real sustenance that uh, because you step away from that and you and you're kind of I mean for myself I'm at sea mm -hmm. I tried briefly to sort of go and live in a different community and uh, and I just didn't I just didn't fit in. I didn't. Right. I didn't fit in. You know. I well, was, you must be. Uh, are you thrilled when you're on the set? Do you say anything to them, or are you like, do you, hey, move over in the light. You're not in the light. Or do you just do no. you just zip it? No, I didn't do anything. When my son <laughs> Quinn came back, and he had two pretty substantial scenes to shoot this season. Uh huh. And so he's the character's a little bit older, and so he had more to do. And all that I did with him is I ran his lines with mm -hmm. him a couple times just to make sure the day before. And then I said, "What do you think this? What do you think the scene's about?" And he's just he knew exactly what the scene was about. And mm -hmm. he, through osmosis or just his own kind of gift, um, it's not like he sat and studied me yeah. on Bosch. But he has uh, he had has an ability and a gift to be able to he gets the character, mm -hmm. and and it's taken that responsibility of of portraying him as as a young man, and yet it it bookends so beautifully because you see the scenes that Quinn does, and then we move in, you see Harry in, in present day as an yeah. adult, and it's it's kind of seamless. But that has nothing to do with me. Yeah. I in fact watched him do. A take and a master, and then made a point of of um, kind of not being in evidence and allowing mm -hmm. him to have his relationship with the director and and the crew and just back right. off because it's that that's just not not the way I am and I, I've never certainly never pressured them. I was never saying, "Aren't you going to try out for the school play?" Right. Never or anything. When they came to me about doing it, I said, "If you want to do it, do it. Mm -hmm. It's fine." But I just want you to do something that makes you happy and makes yeah. you get up in the morning and, and, and excites you. That's mm -hmm. all I care about. And is, uh, it, do, you, it, do you think directing is the next logical step for you on the show? Or do you It's a little hard. Acting? I mean, I, you You're know. You're in every scene. It's very difficult. Yeah, it's difficult to try to schedule something like that. I think yeah. it would be difficult. I think with a feature, you're able to do that a little bit easier. It's not to say never. Mm. And I've directed theater in the past, and, mm -hmm. and I, I, would like to, I would like to direct. But... Um, I'm not stupid. I mean, there is so uh, there is so much to do that I think that it would be almost virtually impossible. Because yeah. if you think about really being a director and being pretty much in every scene, yeah. then when do you go home? There's, mm -hmm. you know, you just kind of go. I'm going to give up my turnaround for the next 
12 days and I'm, you know. Right. Because it's not just, I'm going to show up and call action. It's yeah. certainly not. And look, we have, we have such great directors uh, that I have, you know, wholehearted confidence in to, that would, so it's kind of, it ain't broke. Yeah. But I'll come and. Could be. Well, keep acting. Uh, Titus, thank you so much <laughs> for you. This doing this. It's been a blast to uh, to have you here. Please come back. I will absolutely. Please anytime. come back anytime. Anytime. You can tell more stories on Rough Riders. Absolutely. You can thank see you. Titus on Bosch on Amazon, and yes. he's at Welliver underscore Titus on Twitter. Thank you very much. Um, we'll have all of those links um, on our website, which is Ileana'spodcast dot com. Buy Ileana's book. I blame Dennis That's Hopper. Right. It's available in bookstores and on Amazon. And <laughs> And also like our Facebook page. That is all. Thank you, everyone. Everyone's life, and as we always say, everyone's life is a movie with a beginning and a middle and an end. And sadly, this is the end of ours. But please come back. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. From producers Maria Menunos, Kevin Undergaro, Phil Svitek, and the entire Popcorn Talk Network, we would like to thank you for tuning in. For questions or comments, be sure to visit popcorntalk.com. I'm Sir Richard Wentworth, and this has been a presentation of the Popcorn Talk Network. The views expressed herein are those of the hosts only and do not necessarily reflect the views of the Popcorn Talk Network or its owners or principals.